The talk really is focusing on metamorphosis, a severe challenge to Darwinian evolution. And you'll see the amazing comparison between what, what evolution is supposed to do and what it would have to do in order to produce metamorphosis. First, we need to kind of understand a little background information on what evolution theory is and what it does. It describes the diversity of plants and animals uh, developed over time. So from one type of plant to another type, that's what evolutionary theory would do. But there's something else called evolutionary development, shortened as evo devo. And that's describes how the developmental process is in an organism evolved. So it's a, it's a subset of that. It's how did an, a particular organism get to be the way it is, where a broader picture of evolution theory is how did amoeba turn into elephants? Now, the different pieces of evolutionary theory are random variation. And I think most people understand that. And, and I personally fully accept that. If you had a litter of puppies, they're not identical. There's one that's taller, there's one got a longer body, maybe different coloring. I accept random variation. And in fact, that's what Gregor Mendel observed and went into his studies of, of genetics. The next piece is natural selection, that the idea of evolution chooses advantages and maintains those into future generations. I also personally fully accept that. In fact, when I look at my lawn and I see the weeds out there, that's natural selection going on, that weeds are more suited to grow in my lawn. That's not what I want, but that's what natural selection does. And of course, we use this idea of selection artificially. That's how we breed cattle for better meat, for more milk production. That's how we get grains that have increased in productivity maybe three times over the past hundred years. So we're able to feed the world through artificial selection. Now, the third and the most controversial part of evolutionary theory is single universal common ancestry. That again goes everything occurred from one and it developed from there. And that's the one that's hardest for me to accept. In fact, I, I can accept that because it's just too complicated. There's too many changes that are needed to do that. And let me just give you an example of how this works. Uh, evolutionary theory is looked at in 2020 hindsight. And I'll come back to that again and talk about how people explain something based on what they see. But if you're going forward, you have to have a design, you have to have a plan. A good example is if I wake up in the morning and I don't have milk for my cereal, I need to go to the store. The store is pretty close, but I counted them and I go through eight different intersections to get to the grocery store. In each case, I choose the direction I'm gonna go and I'm planned it. I'm looking ahead, I know what I'm gonna do. First intersection, I've got three choices. I can go left, straight ahead, or right. Same thing on the second, the third, and the fourth, and so on. Now, if I was doing this by some random process, I could take a die with me, roll the die, and if it had a one or two, I would go left. Three or four, I would go straight. A five or six, and I would go right. And at each of those eight intersections, I would choose that. Well, if you count up how many possibilities are, there are 60,000 choices, different paths that I would take. And when I look at it on the map, only one of those 60,000 choices gets me to the grocery store to get that milk. Likewise, if I wanna come home, I'm at the store and I use my random selector, I have 60,000 ways to get to my house. Only one of those works. And if you multiply the whole path to the store, and back, there's on the order of 8 million or billion different choices uh, to the store and back. And only one of those will get me to the store and back home with milk. Now, this becomes important over longer periods of time. With a single universal common ancestor, this is, as I say, billions of years have made these changes. 
So the, the choices are almost uncountable in ending up with something that works. There's all, they say, well, here we are. Well, yes, that's one chance in some incredible astronomical number. When we go fishing in Canada, we leave a town called Fort Francis and head north to Dryden. Partway down that road, there's a sign saying, no services for the next 180 kilometers, which is about 120 miles. If you didn't have that sign and didn't plan ahead, it's almost certain that you're gonna run out of food or fuel on your way to that stop. Also about every few miles, there's side roads. And if you started doing random solution, there's uncounted trillions of choices you would never get to Dryden. And if you think about it, there's there's times when we've made, uh, people have learned this, not knowing where they were gonna go. That's how people discovered Death Valley. Not everyone took the uh, route to the, uh, the trail, the Oregon Trail to, camp, to the West. Some ended up in Death Valley and some of them come back with the stories that that was not a good choice. So the single universal ancestor really is stretching it. In, in hindsight, it might look good. In, re, in forward sight, it doesn't look so good. How would you get there? Now, evolution theory says changes during development can be used via, as a template to describe long-term evolution. When you, this is the evo-devo idea, looking at development. For example, a tadpole starts in water, and then over time, it develops. It starts as the egg. It moves on to a tadpole. The tadpole has gills and tail for swimming. Over a period of time, the lungs replace the gills and the legs replace the tail. Put these all together and you have a pattern, a progression from a water-based to a land-based animal. So they talk about, okay, that's how it works. But one thing to point out, very few frogs give birth to live frogs. Most of them go through this egg process. So they really haven't evolved. It's a process during their life cycle, but it hasn't evolved to a new type. The frogs still lay eggs, which grew up to be frogs going through that progression. There are some problems with that uh, progression. I mean, looking back at things, there have been missing links ever since Darwin proposed his theory of evolution. So there's links in the transition and we kind of fill in so we just haven't found them. Well, we've been digging up fossils for well over a hundred years and a lot of those gaps are still there. Sometime we see a, a uniform progression like dogs. And I'll come back to that in just a minute here. Other times, though, you have abrupt, cha abrupt changes such as metamorphosis in butterflies and wasps. So one of the questions there is how, how does that fit? Well, the tree of life that's used in evolutionary planning was built on hindsight. People have put things together to fit, but that doesn't mean how they're linked and how they're connected. Here's a quote from Scientific American, an article on insect metamorphosis. And think this through carefully as I read it. However metamorphosis evolved, the enormous numbers of metamorphosing insects on the planet speak for its success as a reproductive strategy. The primary advantage of complete metamorphosis is eliminating competition between the young and the old. Larval insects and adult insects occupy very different ecological niches. I just stop for a minute. At first level, I think that makes sense. But let me point out two things. Do you think there's really a problem between the larval insects and the adult butterfly? I mean, is a caterpillar and a butterfly competing with each other, they eat things entirely different. Would, would there have been a problem with that? That there was too many caterpillars and so they had to evolve into butterflies to avoid that overload. So it's, it's done kind of by 
2020 hindsight explaining something that sounds very logical. But think about something else. Are cockroaches, crickets, ants just about extinct because they don't go through complete metamorphosis? Is there such pressure and competition that it's not working? So I think at first thought, it seems right. But if you think about it very carefully, it's not that logical. Let's talk about dogs. We see uniform growth, but very seldom do we see external transitions of steps. We do see the puppy paws disappear as the rest of the dog grows and it develops its adult proportion. What I thought was interesting is the legs grow longer, which is opposite what you'd expect from gravity. You know, there's a dog walking around, but yet the legs are growing longer. That seems to be opposed, but it happens, but we're not gonna go on to other things. Next one we'll talk about is crickets. Crickets have similar appearance, so they do not go through this radical metamorphosis, but they have different steps where they molt, that they split their outer shell, the cuticle, and a new one emerges, which then the cuticle hardens and we have a larger cricket. And from a starting cricket, to an adult cricket, there's about five or six molts. <clears throat> now, we're gonna show you a video clip a little bit and they do analogy that this cuticle on a, a cricket is fairly stiff, but you can think of it as like a suit of armor. Can you imagine getting out of a suit of armor, getting those legs? Look at all the leg joints in there. How would you go through that suit of armor to release it and the antenna? It's, it's absolutely amazing this works, but we're not gonna talk about those problems. We're gonna go on to bigger problems. Let's go with grasshoppers. So grasshoppers, little grasshoppers, big hat grasshoppers are similar, but they do increase their wing size with the molts. Originally, you really don't have wings. You just have wing pads that are starting there. And then the final molt is where they come out with wings and can actually fly. But you see the same problem when a, when a grasshopper has to molt, it has to split that skin. It has to get out of that outer casing and the newer one emerge from the inside. How do those legs get out of that shell? How do the antenna come out? I just can't imagine the experience of being a grasshopper. And internally, it's even worse because the inside of it, the digestive system is connected to the outside. So after the mold, I've heard that a grasshopper actually has to regrow some of its mouth parts and part of its intestine that were lost during the process of molting. Here's what we're gonna spend most of our time talking about is butterflies. At the top there, you see the different stages of the butterfly. You start with an egg that hatches to the caterpillar. You'll see this just a little bit example in a movie in a few minutes or after the caterpillar goes through five or six molds, it goes into the chrysalis stage. And the chrysalis stage is where it transforms into the butterfly. That bottom picture is a, from a chrysalis just before the butterfly emerges. When you look at some of the chrysalis in the movie, I wanna point out that the chrysalis is very green in color. It's only in the last day that these colors form and these colors are the wings of that butterfly. What happens in the chrysalis? There's a whole range of process that occur. We go from the caterpillar shape to a thinner, lighter, multi-segmented body. We have sing long, thin, segmented legs. We have now four wings. Uh, obviously, caterpillars have no wings. Now suddenly we have four. We have a tongue that comes out for a, a pulling in nectar, which is mouth parts for chewing. It has to change its digestive system from eating plant uh, leaves now to eat nectar. It has an approved sense of smell and taste, whole, totally different eyes. 
Okay, that's that list. I wanted to challenge you, and I'm going to challenge you with this list again in a little while. Which of these features are not essential? Which one could have come first? There's two ways. Let's go forward or backward. What would be the last thing? Can you imagine a butterfly that didn't have long legs? Can you imagine a butterfly that didn't have wings? On the other hand, can you imagine a caterpillar that would start with wings? Can you imagine a caterpillar that would start with large eyes? There would be no evolutionary advantage there. So that's what I want you to think about. And we're going to come back after this video and talk about that a little more. This is a film clip from a movie produced by a John 1010 project. It's uh, a Lustra Media, and at the very end, I will show you where you can get this movie, this film clip, and download it. It's part of a large, about an hour-long movie on metamorphosis. Let me start it, and it runs, I think, about 10 minutes here. On a planet bursting with mystery and wonder, perhaps no phenomena triggers a sense of the miraculous more clearly than the life cycle of a butterfly. Depending upon its species, a female butterfly can lay hundreds of eggs during her brief lifetime. Each initiates an extraordinary process of growth and transformation. The eggs are remarkable in themselves. They have species-specific architectures, some of which are just astonishing. For instance, if you look at a monarch egg, it has a beautiful symmetrical structure. It looks like a little miniature dome or cathedral. Ranging in size from a pinhead, to the width of a child's fingernail. Each egg is attached to a plant by an adhesive fluid secreted by the butterfly. They are lined with a coating of wax that helps keep them moist and viable. In many species, the eggs hatch within a week. Then the newly emerged caterpillar or larva wastes no time embarking on the second stage of its journey to adulthood. We call them eating machines because that's their only purpose in life is to just eat and grow. It's just munch, 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 munch. Slice and chew, slice and chew. To build up the raw materials for the next stage of life. A caterpillar could gain in weight so fast that it would, would be eating its own weight in leaves, leafy material every day. Equipped with powerful jaws and a digestive tract that extends the length of its body, this stomach with legs can multiply its birth weight more than 3,000 times in less than two weeks. To show you how remarkable this weight gain is, imagine you had an eight pound human baby and he multiplied his weight 3,000 times as he was growing. That would be a 24,000 pound child. That's a big kid. <laughs> a caterpillar's growth is punctuated by violent surges of transition called molts. Imagine the outer skin of a caterpillar as being sort of like a wetsuit. It's got a little bit of stretch to it, but limited. It's waterproof, so they don't dehydrate. Now, as the caterpillar grows, it fills out that wetsuit, and eventually it reaches a point where it can't grow anymore, and it has to make a new, larger version on the inside. A molt begins when a caterpillar spins and then grasps a silk pad anchors its body securely with small barbs on its legs and splits its skin near the capsule covering its head. There are sensors in the cuticle, in the skin of the caterpillar, 
strain detectors. They detect the amount of pressure or strain being put on the skin. And when that is too great, they send a signal to the brain of the caterpillar, which then releases a hormone that causes molting. After several molts, the caterpillar stops eating, finds a secluded spot, and spins another silk pad. When finished, it attaches itself with a pair of claspers on the end of its body, then hangs, almost motionless. It will hang there for a day or so, usually in a J position. All kinds of chemical reactions occur within that caterpillar. It changes color and you have no idea what's going on inside there until all of a sudden it pumps the fluid so that the skin begins to split. The caterpillar's final molt marks the beginning of the third stage of a butterfly's development and the appearance of a remarkable structure called a chrysalis. As the old skin is pushed away, the cremaster, a thin extension on the top of the chrysalis, works its way into position to permanently grasp the silk pad. With a scanning electron microscope, the cremaster is magnified more than 500 times. The caterpillar has microscopic hooks on the cremaster, and it attaches those hooks to that silk pad that it puts on the bottom of a leaf or twig. And it begins to spin, and this caterpillar spins and spins and spins because it wants to get rid of that old skin that it has. During the hour that follows, the chrysalis hardens and takes its final form as one of the most fascinating processes in nature is set into motion. The metamorphosis from caterpillar into butterfly. What you see in a chrysalis is not a shapeless mass, but in fact, something very much like a mold for the adult butterfly. You see the wing pads where the adult wings are going to form. And you see the head and the compound eyes appear, visible through the outer case of the pupal shell. Abdominal segments are very clearly separated from the thoracic segments where the wings are going to be attached. All of this is astoundingly new compared to the caterpillar where everything looked sort of the same down the whole length of the body. In a metamorphic insect, what you've got is two body plans. You have to first form one functional body plan, and then you have to switch gears, and you have to take and form a new body plan. I am amazed by development when it goes from egg to caterpillar, because it's such an intricate process. But then you have to enter into the chrysalis stage, and you have to get it right again. So it's like the problem squared. The creation of a butterfly begins with the partial destruction of the caterpillar. Inside the chrysalis, larval cells that form the caterpillar's limbs and organs are systematically digested and broken down. You've got to get rid of or digest the caterpillar tissues. They won't work for the adult. In fact, the cells themselves disappear, but then their components are recycled and are turned into a kind of soup out of which the adult structures will be built. The magnitude of this transformation has been compared to a Model T Ford that suddenly encases itself within a garage. Inside, most of the car breaks down into fragments of metal, rubber, and glass.
these pieces then reorganize themselves into components more complex than any that previously existed in the Model T. After several days, the garage door bursts open and a radically different mode of transportation lifts off into the sky. Now, an analogy like that is pure whimsy. But even if it were somehow possible, I don't think turning a car into a helicopter would be nearly as impressive as the actual transformation that takes place inside a chrysalis. It's impossible to look at a caterpillar turning into a butterfly and not ask how. How did this happen? How is it regulated? How is it controlled? This astonishing, remarkable transformation. When you process all the evidence revealed through metamorphosis, and then you ask yourself, in your own experience, what kind of cause could bring about these results? I think the only reasonable answer is an intelligence that transcends the natural world. A designer with foresight and a sense of engineering and artistry. And the ability to light up the sky on a summer afternoon with magnificent evidence that life on Earth is the product of something greater than a blind, undirected process. The last slide of this presentation will be resources where you can go to the website and down link download that video clip. It's amazing. I saw that several years ago, and that's what got me started looking at this in more detail. And as you dig, there's more than that's even in that video. It's even more amazing. And I'll try and add to what you see in there. So let's look at those structural changes one thing at a time. So we have a lighter, thinner, multi-segmented body. The three segments of thorax each has a pair of legs attached to it. Second and third also have a pair of wings attached. It now has six long, thin, segmented legs instead of the uh, 16 stumpy ones that a caterpillar had. The hind four legs grab vegetation and flowers when the butterfly lands on the plant. The two are held close to the body. So if you in the upper left there, you really can't see those front two, but if you go online, you'll see other pictures of butterflies that show them. And they're, you see they're used to taste test milkweed before they lay eggs. Also, it has four wings. Two four wings, two hind wings, and they're attached to the second and third body segment. If you watch a butterfly, when the process of wings flying, it's kind of like fish fins that the four wings kind of lead and the hind wings kind of follow, which gives it a forward motion. And you really need four wings to balance. If you just had one wing on each side, it wouldn't be as stable. But it's not just wings. You need to have the necessary muscles and the system to inflate them when it comes out of the chrysalis. So they're all compact. It's like a Hubble Space Telescope that's all packed inside the capsule. It goes up, it expands, it puts out solar panels, it, it checks itself, it gets going. And of course, uh, now you're talking billion dollar telescope that's carefully designed over a period of multiple years. <clears throat> and yet what's in a caterpillar is much more impressive, I think, than that telescope. The hollow tongue is really interesting. It's two parts that come together and fasten almost like Velcro. 
That proboscis is how it samples uh, liquids so it can pick up nectar and water for nourishment because it's no longer eating leaves anymore. So that's why its system changed. It doesn't have the digestive system for dissolving the carbohydrates or the other components in the leaves, but now it's getting nourishment, high energy nectar. The tongue comes out in two halves and must be kind of clipped together after leaving the chrysalis. And after that, you can curl it up so it's stored and out of the way. Another thing is the digestive system. When it was eating the plant material, as it said, it was doubling in weight or eating its weight every day. Now it had to be totally redesigned for digesting nectar instead of leaves. The sensor information is totally upgraded. It's uh, again, different between a Model T and an airplane, which has much better sensors needed for traveling in a different mode and a higher speed. It, it can sense food, it can smell, it can find things. The flowers where it has nectar, it's got to find other butterflies, it's got to find the milkweed plants. Where the caterpillar only had tiny tentacles, which had a very limited sense of smell. Also has a much better sense of sight. The compound eyes, which, which you see if you go online under electron microscope, there are thousands of momotidia, which are like you find in bees' eyes. This allows a butterfly to maneuver its speeds thousands of times faster than the caterpillar, which obviously needs to do. The caterpillar have very simple eyes. So again, it's totally redesigned. There's nothing like a, a step forward, but it's a whole new body design. Okay, we've got these things. We've got a lighter body, which is more aerodynamic, designed for flying rather than crawling. It's stiffer. It's got this multi-segments instead of this kind of wetsuit approach. We've got these long legs. You've got the four wings, the powell, powell tongue, the smaller digestive system, sense of smell and taste and sight. Again, they're all needed. We can't really choose which one came first. We usually can't really decide which one was least important and came last. This is a concept called irreducible complexity. They're all needed at once. It was coined by biochemist, Dr. Michael Behe. He wrote a book called Black Box, Darwin's Black Box, which is how all these things came together. But uh, evolutionary approach as well, it just happened. We don't have a mechanism, we're still studying it. But it's inconceivable how these would come together. It's found in other systems. If you want to read more, look at that book and see what's got there. Another amazing part is in the chrysalis, you've got two weeks starting now. You've got to dissolve your old structures and recycle them because the chrysalis isn't bringing in new materials. It's what it carries in there is what it has to work with. The proteins are recycled. Then it builds new structures, but again, they have to be folded in a very compact way. <clears throat> so on emergence, it's ready to go. Oh, and during this process, you need to stay alive. So the, while it's being rebuilt, it's not like going in the hospital and have a surgery, a surgeon working on you, it's you're doing your own surgery right there. And here's some things that aren't in that video, but you can find them online as well. At the genetic level, the changes that are driving, the, the genetic variations that are driving these physical changes are amazing. That bottom uh, reference there is to a paper on swallowtail butterflies. And in there, there uh, this paper, it lists over 1,500 differences in gene expressions. These are the gene expressions that trigger the changes from a caterpillar going into the chrysalis stage to start that reformation. And while it's in there, there is almost 1,200 more gene expressions between the chrysalis and butterfly. All these changes are necessary to end up in that change from caterpillar to chrysalis to butterfly. If you had one or two less, it would be incomplete. It wouldn't be functional. 
you know, which one couldn't you do without? But wait, there's still more. The colors in the wing is not a pigment. In other words, you don't pour in co color somehow. It's grown. They're nanostructured scales. You probably know that technology because we copied that concept and we can get televisions that are based on quantum dot technology. There's actually small particles that interact with light so that only that color shows. And amazingly, they grow in about a day. So the a chrysalis of a monarch is greenish until that last day when we now see the colors of the wings through the outside of that. More amazing thing, a butterfly emerges from the chrysalis, inflates its wings in perhaps an hour and is ready to fly. Think of children. You know, how long is the toddler that crawling gets to finally able to walk over a period of weeks you look at a baby with eye tracking, it takes weeks until a baby can focus. Here, the butterfly emerges, and with an hour, it's ready to move. Everything is functional. It's ready to move out. I want you to think about what that is. We've, we've got amazing technology today, but you have a car, and you take it in your auto mechanic. Maybe you have the warning light on the dash come in, and there's something wrong, and they read out the problem. Uh, you go in to get your brakes changed and your oil changed and all these other things. You take your car in and you have to drive your car into the shop to get those changes done. Now imagine your car pulling into a rest area where the car reconfigures it it's into a plane while the engine's running, produces the power. In other words, the engine power reconfigures the whole thing, like the Model T to helicopter. Also, your new plane has fully autonomous control, better than Tesla or Waymo, and it refuels itself. You don't have to take the gas stations or plug it into a charging station. It finds its own fuel, and at the end of its useful life, it regenerates and replaces itself. That's what the butterfly does. It's amazing. Well, look at this whole story. I think that the data of metamorphosis just does not fit the process in the theory of evolution. Well, look back at what I've said. Are there some errors? I'm gonna give you the references. You can go online and look for yourself. Is there something I misrepresented? Is there something that wasn't there? I try to be very careful of just reporting what I find out of the available literature. What does this mean for you? Well, I would think most of the people on this call just think evolution is impossible already. And now you've seen kind of a quantitative logical approach why. Yet there are people who will still choose to believe in evolution. But based on this data, I think that requires a lot of faith. Stop, wait, did I just say evolution is based on faith? It really is. Uh, people say science proves evolution is true. That's not correct. We know about random notations. We know about survival of the fittest and forcing uh, breeding. But this whole idea of stringing them all together over thousands, millions, and billions of years, that is a life view that requires a lot of faith. So really, Evolution is based on faith. You take some data and you choose life view. Others take that data and say, evolution is impossible. We need something else. Richard Dawkins has said, although atheism might have been logically tenable before Darwin, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. And you'll hear that quote a lot. I'd say that he is way too optimistic and he's been blinded because he wants a worldview that doesn't require intelligent design. All the things we see here seem to be pre-programmed from the beginning. <clears throat> How could you start this process? Could you have a butterfly that lays eggs that turn into tiny butterflies that mold? No, it, there's no way we can imagine that happening. The way it works is we have to go through that step of caterpillars. Eggs go to caterpillars, which then grow through the molting process, simpler molting process. 
But then how does a caterpillar turn into a butterfly with all these thousands of genetic changes they just cannot occur a step at a time and move ahead. I see no other option than intelligent design. And I promised you references. Let me just describe what these are. At first, there is that film clip. If you go to the John 1010 project and look for one called the Everyday Miracle, that is this roughly 10 or 11 minute film clip and you can download it at various resolutions. That's how I got this and added to this presentation. Um, my wife, who is a biostatistician, and I went together and put this into a paper and published it this last fall in a magazine called Salvo. So if you wanted a couple page summary of this in written form uh, before the YouTube version comes out, you can go to that magazine and read it there. The next one is the... Uh, looking at the genetic changes in there. There's the official, the full reference going to that uh, article that uh, my wife found that to add it into this presentation. And the third one, she also, the next one down there about the butterfly wings are the focal spots, which goes back to the point about them being quantum dots. Next a bullet is Darwin's black box. That's the one that talked about irreducible complexity and gives you some other examples. And I encourage you to get that book and read some of the amazing things in there. And again, the concept there is Darwin had a black box that somehow you put stuff in and it magically comes out the other side and evolution doesn't know how that works. And it's just, well, it happened here. Here it is. Uh, when you look at it, it's so complex. I think many of us say that's impossible. It can't just happen. If you want to go and look at related issues, you can go to the Discovery Institute website there, and they have a lot of good books on these images. And finally, the last two bullets give credit to the images that uh, I used in this presentation. And at this time, I'm going to finish this presentation. And I'm going to leave this up for a while and check with my wife to see if we have some questions. Not yet. Okay. At this point, we have not received any questions yet. Okay, there's one question. It says, can you give a list of different animals that go through the process of metamorphosis? I cannot, but if you go back and study, go online and look at that, that Scientific American reference on the process of metamorphosis mentions that there is many butterflies and moths that go through it. So this, I'm gonna give that to you as homework. I do not know the answer, but there seem to be quite a few based on that article. Then there's one, it says, about the DNA present at the beginning, does it go through different reading frames at the different stages? That sounds like a biological question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can answer that. And it, it is different genes. It's not just different reading, um, reading frames. It's totally different genes that are expressed. And then in a different stage of it, other genes get turned on and the other gene First genes get turned off. It sure is good to have a biostatistician back up here. <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? How do evolutionists explain metamorphosis? <laughs> Okay, I will try to do that. It's, it goes back to this black box. They say, well, we don't quite know all the details yet. But we're still working on it. But I don't, I think they kind of look at it from the big picture. Uh, evolution again is done by 2020 hindsight. They kind of look at things and try and make a plan of how things put together. I'm uh, using the analogy of looking at fossils. You get lots of fossils, you try and correlate the structure, the levels of the fossils and say these are together. And then you put them in a sequence 
on, on tree of life and, and say how they're interrelated. I think it comes back to that same kind of approach. They don't really know, but they try and come up with a rough thought, but uh, they don't have the details. There's not a mechanism. Like if from, uh, I'm an engineer and when I wanna build something, I would come up with a plan of what it's going to be like. But let me, I think most of you know software. So there's a big difference between a flow chart and a functioning code. A flow chart is just a, this process, this process, this process, and then you write code that ties this all together. But I think the analogy is there that it takes a lot more. You could write a flow chart in a matter of hours, but many codes take months or years to get them all debugged and getting functional. I think it's the same problem here. They just don't know the details, but they have a very compelling analogy like this idea of, well, we don't know how it worked, but the metamorphosis moves them in different ecological niches. And so they're not competing for resources. It's like, yeah, that makes sense. And they say, how does that work? Can you show me how that happened? And then they run up against the dead end. Okay, we have some more questions that have been coming in. Uh, the first one is, if the cells of the, of the caterpillar are digested, is that down to the organelles? What remains to power the process? Is the biologist going to answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure the, the um, paper that we were talking about with the different genes didn't go into that much detail. My guess is that they're completely digesting the cells, it would be down to the organelles that have to be remade, but that's a guess. Uh, what were possible predecessors of the butterfly on the evolutionary time frame? I have never seen a precursor to a butterfly on that scale. You know, if you look at what people find in fossils, it would probably be simpler and I think you get into this problem of pre-Cambrian that the body parts were so soft, they weren't stabilized, they were not maintained through the process of uh, producing fossils. So I, th I think they dodged that. So I, I think they would say there's no, there's no evolutionary precursor. And I think in the, what was it, the Carboniferous Age or something, you see these huge butterflies that were two feet across or whatever they were, but they kind of look like today's butterflies. They're just much larger. Okay, we're getting quite a few questions here. Let me get back up to the top. Um, do we understand the protein chemistry going on during all these reformations? The reformations are at the molecular level, and right? Different proteins must be assembled. I would say we don't know. Going back to that uh, third bullet there, that paper, they more or less look what's there. They haven't gone to the detail of trying to understand how they would change, which I think is really the question there. Um, the next question is, would you say that there are two different sets of DNA and the second kicks in during the chrysalis stage. And I think that would be something I, I would no, answer. I, I don't think it would be different DNA. I would think it's just the uh, genetic expression changes. I think the DNA stays the same. Yes, I would guess so too. So Pro again, the, the concept is that the DNA is kind of your basic code or or database of information. And then that is used inside the cells and decoded to make the different things. And the gene expressions take that information and then build new proteins if necessary. I would have to uh, go back and answer that previous question. I would guess some new proteins are formed from that material that you would not just be able to reconfigure proteins, but you'd have to have to use ribosomes to construct new 
proteins. Well, there's a whole system of of signaling system of which genes get expressed in all cells in a regular, not during metamorphosis. And I'm guessing that same thing would happen here that all the DNA is there. It's just that there's something called transcription factors that signal which genes should be expressed. And some get turned on at certain times and others get turned on at other times. Okay, so the next question, why do you think God adopted this process for butterflies? Why didn't he just make butterflies lay eggs that hatch directly into butterflies? Well, I think there's two answers to that. Let me do the first one. And I think that's the easiest one. I think God wants to confound those who think they're wise. You know, take the, the ones who think they're so wise and make them appear foolish when they really look down on it. And the other one is, the second question is kind of a functional one. You'd have to have an egg as big as a butterfly. So it's, it, 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 it's kind of like chicken and eggs. If you want an egg to hatch into a fully formed chicken, the egg has to be as big as the chicken. And then how would a chicken lay that egg? So I think that's the question you're asking. You'd have to have a butterfly lay an egg big enough to have a butterfly inside or else have butterflies that could somehow molt. And I don't think anything that has wings can molt. Like the, the molting on uh, grasshoppers occurs before the wings are fully formed. All there are are wing pads. It's only in the very last molt when there's fully functional wings come out. So if God would do that, it would really be amazing. I'd love to see how you'd have butterfly leg eggs that hatch into butterflies. Okay, there's one more question so far. It's a good one. <laughs> what animals that eat plants have microbes in their gut to digest the, or most animals that eat plants have microbes in their gut to digest the cellulose present in the plant material? I'd assume there are bacteria in the gut of a caterpillar how does metamorphosing the butterfly deal with these bacteria? Does the chrysalis sterilize its interior environment? Actually, I thought part about that, so I might try answering that. Did you notice that when the caterpillar hatches, it doesn't start eating the plant first, it actually eats the egg casing? I'm going to speculate. I don't know the answer, but I'm going to speculate and say possibly that egg casing has something similar to colostrum. You know, when a, when a baby is born, it doesn't have bacteria in its gut either. But the, back, but the colostrum is kind of a way of, of priming the gut. Is, is that right? Let's see. That the colostrum is, has things yeah, inside I forgot. of it and start things going. I, I'm not sure. It seems but, like that was something like that. But it is a very good question. You, you have this, I thought of the same thing. Here's this caterpillar. It needs to start eating. How can it digest it? Because most of that, uh, like cows and such, they're symbiotic with bacteria that's digesting the cellulose. And I would think that the leaves of milkweed I uh, have a, a high percentage of cellulose as well, along with the carbohydrates. Oh, and another little factor that's not in here is, I think most of you know that milkweeds are toxic to most things, except monarch caterpillars. So monarch caterpillars ingest this toxin and they seem to live with it, symbiotic relationship. And when birds eat a monarch caterpillar, they get quite sick and vomit that out right away. And so birds lean not, learn not to eat monarch caterpillars, which is a protective mechanism. And earlier there was a question on who, um, which animals go through metamorphosis. And somebody else answered and said that it is frogs, butterflies, insects, amphibian salamanders, termites, beetles, ants, and then they said termites again. So those are the animals that go through some sort of a metamorphic change. 
And a couple more questions here. Is that microbes? Oh, I guess not. There's just host and symbiota, control gut, microbe. Oh, that was to everyone. Sure. Yeah, so you could see a reference there, which is a better answer to that question about the. the yeah, from David, it's microbiology. in the chat. Any other questions? Well, we hope you okay. all enjoyed it. Yeah, we appreciate you turning in and tuning in. And just remember, we will take the recording and put that on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. So if you know someone else who missed it, you'll be able to refer that to, to them. And I've left the references up here. I hope you'll be able to take use of some of those and, and learn more if you're interested about these details. Thanks again, and we'll, well alert you. The other thing is we're going to be having other talks in the future, so be looking for them. Okay. Thanks again for tuning in.